Welcome to Commissioner's Corner. I'm your host, Lois Leonard, and today we're going to talk about your health and how the city plays a role. Feeling good is not only vital for us individually, but our community thrives when we are all at our physical and mental best. But how can the city affect our health? Today, we've invited Monica Valdez Lupi, Executive Director of the Boston Public Health Commission. Previously, she served as Deputy Commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and for six years was Chief of Staff at the Boston Public Health Commission. Thanks very much, Monica. It's great to meet you. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, Boston's Public Health Department is the oldest in the country, which I found very impressive. I was very proud of that. Um, you have a budget of over $160 million. You oversee 1,100 employees. Tell us, how do you keep that all organized? Uh, the, the health department, the, the commission is the local health department for the city of Boston, as you said, and it's a fantastic place to work. We have uh, six bureaus, which is how we stay organized. And so uh, those uh, programmatic areas include Boston Emergency Medical Services, Homeless Services, Community Initiatives Bureau, Child Adolescent Family Health, uh, Recovery Services, and uh, Infectious Disease Bureau. And so across those six bureaus uh, is where the, our uh, staff sit and they do the really hard work of promoting uh, good health for all residents in the city. A lot of behind the scenes things that we don't even know about. Um, it's interesting, very interesting. Um, you came on board about a year and a half ago when you did join uh, the BPHC. What did you find was your biggest challenge that you felt was the, the, the toughest job that you had ahead of you? So uh, returning back home to Boston uh, to help lead the health department is uh, just a privilege for me. And it was great to return back to uh, working with Mayor Walsh. I'd worked with him when I was at the State Department of Public Health and he was our state rep. And uh, so I know that in conversations with him and because of the data that we see, there were clearly some key health issues that the new executive director and me in, in this role had to focus on. Uh, we know that in terms of uh, leading causes of premature death, that uh, unintentional over opioid overdoses is the third uh, leading cause of premature death in the city of Boston. So the first is uh, cancer, followed by heart disease, and then unintentional overdoses. So clearly, uh, this is an issue that the mayor has been leading on, both locally and nationally, and it's an issue that many health officials across the nation are uh, battling. Uh, so really looking at what we do now around substance use uh, disorders from prevention, treatment, recovery, support services uh, is one of the top health uh, issues. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work uh, re-energizing our collaborative uh, partnerships with hospitals and health centers. Uh, everyone's very focused on improving population health. And then the third um, area is around the issue of health equity and how do we ensure that we're creating opportunities for everyone in the city uh, to be healthy. Sure. Um, when you speak of the opioid abuse, you know, obviously it is getting a lot of national attention. Um, and I'm sure the public awareness that it's gaining has got to be helpful as we all discuss this problem and it become a mainstream issue. Um, what are you guys, uh, what is your office doing to help prevention? Um, I know overdosing is tough. What are you doing in far, as far as training um, for overdoses? So when we think about prevention in public health, uh, we think about prevention in two different ways. So what you've talked about uh, in terms of overdose prevention is what we consider secondary uh, prevention. So once we have a client or a patient who might be addicted to a substance, uh, we have several programs that are, are called harm reduction uh, programs uh, to try to link them into care. We run a, a needle exchange program. We also run a program called PATHS. Uh, which is a one-stop referral uh, site for family members, people mm -hmm. who are using, uh, cl the clinical providers also call uh, paths. And this year we were actually able to expand uh, the services uh, with uh, some uh, infusion of additional resources and we'll be able to expand in this next fiscal year. So we do a lot of work, uh, for example, with business businesses to train their staff uh, on overdose prevention, how to use Narcan or Naloxone uh, to reverse overdoses. So clearly this is something that impacts all parts of the neighborhood and we've got good sure. engagement from family members, 
people who may be addicted, and also uh, business sector and clinical partners around uh, secondary prevention. On the primary prevention front, how do you prevent people, uh, particularly young people and adolescents, from uh, using to begin with. Uh, we have a lot of work that we do through our school-based health centers and a curriculum that we have in schools uh, focus not only on opioids but tobacco prevention, mm -hmm. alcohol prevention, um, and, and other substances. So we work really collaboratively with the Boston Public Schools and our school-based health clinics and we have a strong uh, peer leadership group uh, so many young people that we work with across the Boston Public Schools. Mayor uh, Walsh uh, and his uh, uh, director for the uh, Mayor's Office of Recovery Services has recently convened uh, an advisory group that's advising the mayor on prevention right now, focused primarily on uh, young people and, and adolescents. And we're doing that with the support of Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation. And so we'll be right. working with, uh, it's a really uh, robust group of uh, interested stakeholders to look at the issue of primary prevention among our young people, our students, and we'll be issuing a, a roadmap uh, recommendations in the fall. Sounds like you have some good partnerships. Monica, many people in our community have very negative attitudes towards addiction. Um, what are your thoughts on that and how can we prevent that? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, when I go to community meetings and I think of even in my own um, uh, interactions on a personal level with friends and family that uh, I haven't met anyone in the city uh, or the state who hasn't been touched by addiction. And so we know that language matters and mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of work with the mayor and the Office of Recovery Services and other stakeholders around stigma and really making sure that people know that language matters and when we talk about people who are battling addiction uh, that it is seen as a, a chronic disease uh, just like someone who might have diabetes or hypertension and um, to make sure that we're providing them with uh, the treatment uh, and the support services that they need to deal with this chronic condition. It's not a moral failing uh, and we know that addiction does not discriminate. So we know so many people from different uh, racial and ethnic groups, uh, people who have resources to put their children and family members into treatment and people who have no resources uh, to cover uh, critical uh, treatment services. So we know that it doesn't discriminate and so uh, really paying attention to language uh, and making sure that we're not stigmatizing it. There are certain words we should not be using. Yes. So you know, there are certain um, historically we're, we've used words like junkie, like addict, and those words just they make me cringe. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a tough tough word to use. I think it is and I think people really are being more thoughtful about this because it could be your spouse, it could mm -hmm. be your child and so to think of the way that we uh, describe people who are really battling a chronic condition is something that we're working on at the Commission right. with the mayor. We have this amazing uh, collaborative of uh, health, health centers. We actually have the largest number of health centers uh, in the city. We have over two dozen. That's, That's I, I've worked in other places where they don't even have two dozen in a state. Uh, so we work very closely with our community health centers. We work really closely with our hospitals on the issue of uh, opioid abuse and prevention and a range of other issues. So everything from how to tackle food insecurity uh, in our neighborhoods. We're doing a, a project now with a, a piloting a, a screening tool with our community health centers uh, to figure out what are the, the barriers to accessing uh, healthy food options. Um, we're doing a lot of work with the health centers now uh, with the neighborhood trauma teams and how we provide uh, uh, solid response and longer term behavioral recovery supports uh, in our neighborhoods that have been impacted by violence. Uh, and we're also working with uh, the hospitals and health centers now as uh, they begin to roll out the new uh, models of care, the accountable care organizations uh, in the state. And so figuring out how we can contribute uh, to those efforts uh, to improve population health is just another way in which we're uh, partnering and working with our hospitals and health centers. Well, recently the mayor launched the neighborhood trauma teams. Let's hear what he had to say. We've come a long way in trauma treatment in Boston. This new program is going to build on that momentum and leverage the strong networks of partners, partnerships that have been built. 
healing is crucial to breaking the cycle of violence. That's probably the most important thing I'll say today. We need to continue to work all together as one team. We might have disagreements along the way, but at the end of the day, it's about reducing the numbers, making our neighborhoods safer. And I know one thing, that this work that we're doing will pay off. What's happening in the city of Boston now, violent crime is down. So are the number of arrests that we have in the city. Over the last three years, we're down nearly 40% in arrests. Together, we can break the cycle of violence. We can help families heal. We can make sure that all Bostonians are thriving. So how is the Trauma Team Initiative going? Well, since it was launched at the Whittier Street Health Center, it's been going well. This is the second year. Uh, we've been able to expand on the work from the first phase of the project. So we had additional resources provided by Children's Hospital Boston and Partners Healthcare System. And uh, we were able to add that uh, to the, the resources that we got from Mayor Walsh. And we have five uh, teams across the city. And the teams are made up of a community health center and a community-based organization. These teams are in Jamaica Plain, Dorchester, Roxbury, East Boston, and Mattapan. And what the teams do is when there is a call uh, that, that comes in uh, to 911 and uh, it involves a shooting or a stabbing or some other type of community violence, uh, we deploy the neighborhood trauma teams uh, to provide that immediate response on the ground uh, to help provide uh, information about the resources that are available to bystanders and families uh, that have witnessed or have been impacted by that violence. Uh, so that's the response piece of the program. And then the second piece is the recovery support services. So uh, through the Health Center partnership, uh, the, the community-based responders actually link those victims and other uh, individuals who are interested in tapping into behavioral health supports uh, at the community health centers. Uh, they, they do that referral piece uh, to the CHC. So unfortunately, uh, it has been uh, a busy time uh, for the neighborhood trauma teams. Uh, this is what uh, we see typically happening in terms of responses mm -hmm. uh, and violence over the summertime uh, tends to spike uh, because of the warmer weather, um, people, you know, kids out of school, a little free time um, and a little hands. free time. <laughs> um, so the neighborhood trauma teams uh, have unfortunately been busy, but it's a new model and we're um, really um, uh, excited by the fact that we're able to couple the, the community-based organization piece with the community health center. That's very uh, encouraging. That's a, it's very unique yeah. in terms of different uh, a different models. So I would say I haven't encountered a model like this uh, in conversations with other health departments in the country. Um, Boston is such a diverse city, and do you believe that everyone is getting fair and equal medical opportunities here, or do we still have a lot of work to do to get closer to um, attaining health equi equity for everybody? I, I mean, that's a really uh, difficult question. Having been here at the city, I started out my public health career 16 years ago at the health department, and the way we were looking at differences in health outcomes was really looking at these persistent um, disparities, so yeah. differences in um, uh, infant mortality rates between blacks uh, and Latinos compared to uh, white uh, women, differences in um, accessing care generally. Um, so what I, I, I can say is that we have seen uh, positive trends in terms of health outcomes uh, because of a whole a host of interventions that we've done with in partnership with hospitals. So you know, in the early 2000s, I would say there was a lot of emphasis on cultural competency training for providers so that they had the language skills and they were aware of the different um, cultural nuances of the patients that they were serving. And we are a really diverse city. We're a majority minority city. So to have that language and cultural competency is critical in terms of in terms of providing care. I would say that the work has evolved. And um, it, prior to my return, uh, the, the health department had infused a racial justice, social justice lens to their work. So really looking at not just when uh, people are presenting in a health center or a hospital, but really looking beyond those clinic walls because we know that more than 80% of what impacts an individual's health is really not about their interaction with the medical or healthcare community. It really is about the housing uh, that they live in, 
uh, having access to safe uh, transportation, um, having uh, a job uh, with benefits that sure. pays well and has opportunities for wellness. Uh, education is another factor. So these things that are described in public health as the social determinants of health are things that we're focusing now as a health department and, and really being more intentional about the way in which we work with other city agencies. So building off of the work that we've done over the years, for example, with the Boston Housing Authority, in partnership with uh, Director McGonigal, we've been able to roll out uh, smoke-free housing across all our uh, housing developments in the city, and we're working with landlords because we know that many people who uh, suffer from asthma and other respiratory conditions live uh, in, in housing developments in the city. So to make sure that we have policies in place to tackle that issue is important. Um, so. Um, another example is around Vision Zero, which is a partnership that we're involved in uh, with uh, Boston EMS, the police department, transportation department, uh, looking at uh, pedestrian and bicycle bicycling injuries and really zeroing in on those hot spots and ensuring that we're not only uh, putting out prevention messages about how to ride your bike safely, like don't wear your headset, uh, <laughs> or no texting while you're driving, but really looking at what are those um, things that we can do to create um, uh, improvements. For example, the passage of the, the, the new ordinance to reduce the speed limit to 25 miles per hour. So those, right. those uh, policy and environmental changes that, uh, that can contribute to you know, an individual taking their own sort of personal responsibility, we need to, as a city, uh, make sure that we're, we're um, maximizing all those policy levers. What else can we do as individuals? It sounds like your department is very busy. You have a, a, a big agenda, and uh, but I'm sure individually we can offer our own help. What can we do? So one, one suggestion I would make is, uh, and we have a really great network of community champions and health champions across our neighborhoods, but w w one thing I talk about with our residents is to uh, become engaged mm -hmm. and uh, partner with not only the health department, but your community health centers and other community-based organizations that are working to promote health. Uh, one example that we have now uh, is that we have created a health equity advisory committee. So if you go to our website, www.bphc.org, uh, we have an application process and we're trying to uh, stand up a new ad advisory group to help advise the health department as we're looking at the health data. Really, what do we do with that data uh, to uh, make sure that we're developing programs and policies that are really addressing community needs and priorities? So, you know, this is one way that I think community members and individuals can uh, help us uh, is to become engaged and, and to be active. I also think, um, given the changes that we're seeing nationally, that it's important for, and I see this uh, with the coalitions that we work with and different partners, really uh, for individuals to speak up and to speak out about how they've benefited uh, from uh, what we've seen with the Affordable Care Act and expansions uh, in terms of access to health insurance. Uh, the state of Massachusetts is unique. The city of Boston, we have uh, practically universal coverage. We have 97% of our population here in the city is insured. And uh, you know, I worry about the erosion of uh, access to care with what we see happening at the federal level. So I feel yeah. like we're really blessed, very fortunate in the city to have an advocate like the mayor uh, who is uh, working hard to ensure that we remain um, the healthiest city uh, that we can be. So, and he's been very vocal about it, too. And he has, yes, and it's yeah. been great, and he's been a leader, and I think he's partnered well with Governor Baker, especially as we're looking at the gains that we've made uh, in the state with health insurance coverage and, and ensuring that people uh, get access to critical care. So it's important for us uh, to hear from our residents about how uh, how this has been important to them, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to go to their uh, primary care doctor or the hospital or health center and how that's helped them be well is important. And I think there's no better advocate than um, the residents themselves. Is this also an opportunity for uh, younger people to get involved and partner with younger people, the younger generation, um, and have them aware of the issues that are at hand? I definitely think that's the case. And we have a really strong peer leadership institute. We use them uh, for many of our focus groups, and they can be champions of, for their own health and their family's health. So I definitely think uh, working with our uh, young people in this city is, is another way 
uh, to get the message out uh, and to create uh, really uh, strategic messages about the importance of health. Sure, get, the, get them while they're young. Mm -hmm. I got it. I, we all need to be accountable. I, I, I appreciate you joining us. Is there any other message that you'd like to send out there today? Anything else that we can um, do for you? I think just uh, you know, stay engaged, I think, and uh, to uh, we have some upcoming opportunities to meet with residents. We're doing uh, neighborhood meetings in partnership with the uh, Department of Neighborhood Development and the uh, Office of Fair Housing and, and Equity. So we're doing a series of uh, community meetings that's focused on the intersection of housing and health. Uh, and so our next one is at the end of the month in Codman Square, and we have several okay. others uh, scheduled, one in the fall in East Boston, uh, which our Deputy Director, Rita Nieves, will be doing in Spanish. Um, so definitely uh, hope to see uh, people at these neighborhood meetings. Well, thanks again for joining us, Monica. We really appreciate it. And thank you, our viewers, for joining us today as well. I encourage everyone to go to the Boston Public Health Commission website at bphc.org and get informed. Your health is important to all of us. I'm Lois Leonard, and I'll see you next time on Commissioner's Corner.